So think about it. Everybody who's listening to this podcast right now has had something not great happen to them in the marketplace, which was really bad in the moment. But if you stretch that timeline out, two weeks, two months, two years, five years, they're like, oh my gosh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because look what I'm able to do now. Hey, welcome back to another awesome episode of Life in a Show podcast. I'm your host, Jason Wojo. On the Life in a Show, we help people make more, work less, and live awesome lives. I am joined by Polish Peter, my co-host, my co-pilot for the episode. Dude, we got an awesome episode today. Yeah, but this is a take 4,549. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the final one right now. Listen, we have an awesome conversation with a gentleman named Robin Pugh. Um, although it's spelled P-O-U, it's Robin Pugh, and he wrote this book called The Reluctant Disciple, and it's a parable about reconciling faith and business. And this is an awesome topic, man, because I think many times we keep these separate, like we think they're distinct. You know, it's, hey, our faith is over here, our business is over here, and they don't intersect, intersect and they don't overlap. And uh, mm -hmm. so I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good uh, parable to because here's the thing, we stories, right? We learn on stories, we've gone on stories. So what I want you guys to consider is this, because, you know, the main character in the book, which, by the way, the name, perfect. I, I don't think you could have picked a better name for that book. Okay, I'll let you guess sure. what it is. We'll yeah. re reveal it at some point. But the other aspect of it is this, you know, the character had a uh, near-death experience. You may not have had that. But you, if you're older than 12 years old, you probably had some kind of impact in your life that was impactful, whether it's bad or good. So how do you reconcile that for yourself, right? You know, what is that thing that you're getting out of that particular event, you know, and looking back, you know, what is that, quote unquote, like in his words, discipleship, right? Um, what I want you to consider, too, is as you are reading this book, you know, one of the things that sometimes we do entrepreneurs do is we may look like we're crazy. Like, why are we doing this? So I asked him a flat out, like, how you deal with that? How you deal with that whole reluctancy? Because we have certain things that we want to do in life, but we're not doing it. So there's a lot of gold nuggets for you to be able to take away from this particular episode, not just from the perspective of this amazing book and the parable, but how you can actually apply this to your own life. So yeah, let's go right now. Here's our interview with Robin Pugh. Robin, what's up, man? Welcome to Life Here Show. Thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Excited about it. Man, I got to tell you. So, like, I am a big reader, and usually my books are business books. They're they're tactical. They're strategic, not stories or parables, typically. And so when I got to hold your book, man, um, I got to tell you, man, first of all, kudos to you. The book was excellent. It was very well written and uh, engaging. And more than that, and this is what I want to kind of focus on in the in the episode, is like the lessons of this parable um, are very relevant for people. They're they're apl applicable to to their life. Um, but before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to write this book? And by the way, the name of the book is called The Reluctant Disciple. If you're if you're watching this on YouTube right now, I'm holding it up. It's called The Reluctant Disciple. Um, the, a parable about reconciling faith and business. So these two uh, really resonate a lot with our audience. So like, why did you write the, write the book? Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me on. I appreciate that you committed time to read it. And uh, if you said that it flowed well and it was well-written, that's high praise. And so uh, first time author of a fictional work, uh, let alone, you know, what I'm calling a parable. And so... Um, it's interesting to to kind of think back over the journey of getting an idea to writing it to getting it published and then you know talking about it out loud to other people um the primary impetus or the catalyst for writing the book was a personal experience that i had on a missions trip to kenya with our church and I had a near-death experience. It, the, the missions trip went awry from our perspective and had this near-death experience. And uh, perhaps we can talk about the details of that in a minute, but just in direct answer to your question, after that experience, I really felt like God was calling me to write a book. And the way that I interpreted that calling was that it would be a memoir, personal memoir, kind of a moment by moment account, because it was so dramatic, like who wouldn't want to read that? 
And I had it about 75% complete, the manuscript. And I was introduced to a book coach, somebody that was helping me think through just how to really put it over the finish line. And he said, well, what's the purpose of the book, Robin? And I said, well, the purpose of the book is to really encourage and motivate men age 33 to 65 that there's more than just their vocation. And so if they're earnest in wanting to kind of ask themselves, what's the purpose of my life? Mm -hmm. uh, the single largest sitting army in the world are the men sitting in the pews at church. And so how could I be part of a movement to catalyze them to this sort of fully integrated faith along with their, their jobs? And he goes, well, the story that I just read, the manuscript that you sent me is that you have to be fired from your job. You have to go on a missions trip to Kenya. You have to have a gun <laughs> to your head and a machete to your neck and almost die. Like, you really think that's going to encourage people to get on the field for God? <laughs> yeah, and let's I was do like, this. Yeah. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah. That was my response. Like, yeah. <laughs> and of course, I immediately understood what he was saying, which is they may read it and that may be entertaining and, whoa, I'm glad that wasn't me, but it may not fulfill your purpose. And, and anybody that's interested in writing a book, and I know you guys are in the process of writing yours, finishing yours, you've got to be really clear on what your purpose is for why you're writing it, because it is so hard. I mean, first world hard, um, because it's just you know, really galvanizing everything on those pages for that purpose. And I said, okay, big shot, what's your idea? And he said, a fictional parable. And I was like, oh, okay, that will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to write a fictional parable. Like I'm just going to make something up. And yet he was right because my highest compliment that I get for that approach is when somebody said, I've never been more in the head of the protagonist of a book than I was for Peter Christensen in The Reluctant Disciple. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, game over. Like, that's it. I don't want you to read my story and sort of be in awe about the drama of it. I would rather you have your own experience through the reading of the book and making it an every man story was the way to go. Well, man, you succeeded. And yeah, it was, it's, it's powerfully written and it connects with a lot of, you know, it, and it reminds me a lot, you know, especially there, there's so much in the book. I think people will find it relevant for themselves. And, you know, in particular, and I don't want to give away kind of the, the plot or anything like that, but essentially here's a guy who's, you know, it's all about, it's, it's about work. It's about the next project. It's about being successful. It's about proving himself. It's about, you know, building these, these luxury homes, which by the way, right off the bat, you know, life in here, we have a lot of real estate focused people. And so the people are going to resonate with that a lot, but talk to me. And, and, and by the way, like, like him, I think a lot of like Peter, the, 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 uh, the main character, I think a lot of people separate their faith in their business and they're, 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 you have your church, you know, and you and you're, and if, if you have a relationship with God and, you know, maybe that's unappreciated, unrecognized, uh, or maybe undervalued, and then you have your business. And so start talk to me about like, you know, you had this experience of, you know, being taken captive and this, this, this crazy kind of, you know, uh, movie worthy uh, experience that must have changed some things for you. And not only in terms of the book, but like before this, you also uh, had your, had your career, you had your, your, your professional life. How did all of this change for you? And how did you start to see this connection between faith and business? Yeah, so I was uh, raised in the church and feel like I've always had a, a faith. And yet I'm an achiever. I mean, all the way back from high school, like work hard, make the grade, you know, get into a good college and, you know, then get, I, I'm trained as an attorney. So get into a good law school. I mean, just cause and effect. I do this, I get this result and practice law for about five years and then had the opportunity to start a business with some friends. And we actually sold that to a group in Nashville. So we got bought and had a pretty early success, which sounds like a good idea. But I think in retrospect, it's really hard because from that point, you're constantly measuring your level of success from that point. So you really rose the bar early 
And what happened to me is that I, of course, you know, cashed the check. I loved, you know, the early success. But after that, every endeavor that I was taking on after that, um, I started feeling like I was getting behind, like everybody was passing me. So number one, comparing myself to others, robbing my joy, um, and also feeling like I was losing, um, losing the game of business. And so in my early mid thirties, I'm thinking, is this it just striving and winning and losing and striving and winning and like, is this it? And, um, you know, I ended up in this ditch and the, by the side of the road in Kenya where, you know, God sort of came down and said, no, no, there's so much more. And this adventure that I've been on since that has been incredible. And so just the, the book is meant to say, hey, you've got your ladder on this building of success and you're trying to cr climb every single rung. But at some point, you don't control the variables that are outside of your control. And you may drop down two, three, four rungs. You may fall all the way to the ground. And what do you have at that point? And so is life more than just striving in the marketplace? And what I failed to really appreciate is God cares about my role in the marketplace. He cares about my job. And so I didn't really understand who I was, who he was, and what my relationship was with him relative to, you know, my the business world, because I'm not called to vocational ministry. That's not my, so my calling, my calling is to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You know, this, I, I love that, man. There's this two things I kind of like. I think of when it comes to challenges that immediately come to mind when someone talks about business and faith. The first one is what you mentioned is like, you know, people, you, you have setbacks and you have expectations based on what you think you should be capable of or accomplishing. And, you know, and the book talks about this a little bit as well of like, you know, what is inherently good or bad? Like, do we, we may, and you, there's a great line in here where it says like, you know, whether it's good or bad depends on the timeline that you use to judge it. Um, and it was, and so, so you have that side of things where it can feel like a, a worldly loss yet maybe it's not, and maybe this is by design and maybe there's a value here. Can you speak to that? Yeah. I mean, what's your measuring stick? Are, are you measuring things according to what your definition of success is, or are you defining success according to what God's plan is for you? And, you know, the story that goes along with that for me is I was in this Bible study and it wasn't sort of a holy huddle like, oh, let's just read Romans. I mean, this, this guy who was discipling us, Mike, he said, I really want to understand the scared eight-year-old boy inside of you, which scared me that he was interested in understanding <laughs> and knowing that scared little boy. And, yep. and it was a closed group and we did these three open sessions and he said, okay, we're closing the group next week. So if you're in show up and if you're not, then you don't need to show up. And for a week I was really wrestling. Mm -hmm. Am I, am I going to commit? Am I going to get into this group? Because I'm scared to death that he's going to reveal the things in me that I am working so hard to otherwise protect and not see the light of day. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating because I, I showed up. I don't know how I mustered the courage, but I showed up. And there was another guy the day, the week before who had been equally challenged in the way that I was. And he and I had kind of talked about it and he didn't show up. And I was thinking, okay, so he's, he's opting out. He's letting his fear and concern for being exposed, keep him out of the game. I'm still equally as fearful, but I'm going to be in the game. And so, um, when I'm, you know, joining this Bible study and we're really coming to understand all of these challenges, I think that's what the, the fear of exposure and, and being truthful about who I am and what I'm trying to accomplish. I started learning how God otherwise judges success, not how I judge success. So is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. So think about it. Everybody who's listening to this podcast right now has had something not great happen to them in the marketplace, which was really bad in the moment. But if you stretch that timeline out two weeks, two months, two years, five years, they're like, 
oh my gosh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because look what I'm able to do now. And for me, that was a job firing. I mean, my identity was attached with the role that I had. My partner moved against me. He fired me. I thought the whole world was coming to an end. Fast forward 15 years, even sooner than that, but even now I'm doing what I do as a result of being freed from that event, from that job. Mm. Gotcha, man. So it sounds like some of the uh, some of your personal experiences made its way into the into the book in a little bit of a, of a different way as well, because some of the some of the parallels between what you're talking about, you also wrote about. So I love that. The other thing that I wanted to mention about a challenge regarding faith in business is, and I can and I listen. I can I can openly attest that I have struggled with this. Is like, you know, the reliance upon one owns skills and abilities and drive and intelligence and create and like all these things we've been blessed with which i by the way i do absolutely believe these are blessings um but running with that on our own versus doing that in concert with christ and with god and like knowing and listening and being united versus like doing it through your own will and i think one of the reasons why this is so hard is because two things. One is I think entrepreneurs, like we, we're, we're different than some people. We we have the, we have that, you know, the, the, um, the drive, whatever it is, the drive, something inside of us that wants to move and do things and, and be successful. But also, you know, and this kind of ties into, you know, how the Bible talks about money and personal possessions so much, because this is a little bit of a, an indicator of our heart and whether we look at these things as ours or we are stewards and then business is the way we make that money. <laughs> so they're connected intimately. Um, and so I can see this internal struggle sometimes and I've experienced it as well um, of like, am I walking in my own abilities or am I, am I walking, you know, with, with, with God's, you know, guidance and with the way he wants me to move. Can you, can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the question that jumps out at me is you made a pretty significant professional decision, like you were on one track and then you were drawn to the coaching and then you've actually excelled in order to be the CEO of the organization. Like that's a that's a whole journey, if I understand your story. And so I think we or I should just say prior to this this near-death experience. I mean, I really did sort of die in the ditch that day. So I think about life prior to the ditch and, and after the ditch. I probably thought about achieving and success in the marketplace as distinctly different from what God is otherwise playing a role in my life. And so if we think about those as binary and, and mutually exclusive, it's very difficult to, to then integrate them. And what I hope to do in the book is bring the reader through a discipleship conversation, which is very authentic about, hey, I'm wrestling with all those things that you just mentioned in your question, and i not called to ministry, so I'm not going to go be a, you know, a full-time missionary, but God's called me to the marketplace for, for what reason? And so I think of them as more enmeshed. And, and what do I mean by that? So Proverbs 18, 16 says, a man's gift makes way for him and ushers him into the great. So take a step back and say, okay, if we're, if we're made in the image of God and he's uniquely gifted each of us, like we're not carbon copies of each other, well, if he wants that gift to be utilized to grow the kingdom and you're called to the marketplace, our job in the marketplace is to fund the church and to influence the people that we come in contact with, with the good news. So our job is to actually be successful to whom much is, uh, is given, much is accepted or expected. And if I can trust you with a little, I can trust you with a lot. So this isn't prosperity gospel. This isn't name it, claim it. What this is, is he's given you certain gifts. Why did he give you those gifts? For what purpose are you called to use those gifts to otherwise build the business or lead the team that you're supposed to lead? Now, all of a sudden, we're not talking about it in binary terms. We're thinking about it more as, okay, this is all working together because you're you're planted right where you are, and that's either a mistake or it's intentional, even if you don't like it. Because if it's intentional, then what are you doing with it at that moment? 
Mm. Got it. Um, well, listen, Robin, I mean, I am first and foremost, I'm sold on the book just from the fact that the main character's name is Peter. I mean, I mean, of with course. that name, you can't go wrong. I mean, so you know what? So I'm sold on that book. All right. Um, so I have a follow up question because one of the things that you mentioned, um, you know, like falling off the ladder earlier mentioned, and then, you know, you see God wants something more from me. If I'm a businessman, if I'm an owner, I'm looking from the perspective, okay, uh, more, that means more business, more bigger, bigger stuff, right? Um, how would you, if the, you know, someone's coming to reading this book, um, how would they have, you know, look at from the perspective, God wants something more from me than what it is right now? Yeah. So when, when you say the word more and you're applying it to like more, like growth, more clients, et cetera, I think what I'm meaning or my experience has been, he wants me to experience more fulfillment. So when I'm using the word more, bigger isn't always better. Nothing wrong right. with growth. <clears throat> I mean, let, let's let have the biggest impact we possibly can that is otherwise authored by God's calling in our life. And so that may be more clients, more revenue, et cetera. But abiding in what the Lord is calling us to do is going to be so much more fulfilling than just attempting to do it out of our own self-reliance, swimming with the sharks, sharp elbows, trying to make things happen. Because God is an, a counterintuitive God, and he will call us to moves that we wouldn't otherwise intuitively make. And so that's just his kingdom, his economy is completely different than our economy. Let me give you an example. Uh, wrote a first book called Performance Intelligence, which is uh, co-authored with a woman, Julie Bell, Principles of Sports Psychology Brought to the Business World. And this is this launched my career as an executive coach and now running this leadership development firm. If I had had the vision to actually say, okay, we're going to write a book and we're going to get it published, then I could have spent 10 years trying to knock on those doors and probably wouldn't have had the success of getting it published through McGraw-Hill, a, a royalty publisher. But because we focused on what are we trying to accomplish? God sort of spoke into us. We need to write a book. We really think this content is useful. We want it to be helpful. If we self-publish it, that's fine. Like we didn't have the execution plan on it. Mm. And all of a sudden, God opened doors in ways that we could never have accomplished. And so it just goes back to a man's gift makes way for him. If God's given you a gift, why wouldn't he part the ways for that gift to see the light of day? And so I've been able to do things, be places, meet people that I would have never have met if I was just trying to do it by my own hand, so to speak. Yeah, I love that. I love that answer because of the fact that there is some faith, there is some courage that needs to be coming from you, the person, you know, on this particular journey. I'm curious. Um, I'm I'm asking much simpler question than Vojo does. He's more intuitive, I think, in some shape or form. I don't know. I don't know why I'm giving him credit right now. Why? What, what's going on here? Okay. But listen, so I got a question for you uh, because obviously one of the things that I had to go through when writing my book is coming up with a title. And it is, that process alone, this can be kind of crazy. Why are you reluctant? Why did you use the word reluctant? Yeah. So when I came back from Kenya and I had been through this Bible study in the year leading up to it, I kind of made a decision that I was going to get on the field for God. Like, this mm -hmm. is the route for me to answer the question, is there more? And I felt like not just a saving faith, but literally spirit filled. Let me get on the field for God. Let me, let me do the best I can to kind of hear what he's calling me to do. I was like, okay, that, that means I'm a disciple at meaning I'm, I'm uh, in the Hebrew. When you decided to follow a, a rabbi, um, he would say, follow me, and you would then be his disciple, and you'd be so close to him that the dust off of his sandals would be on you. Like, that's no light in between you. And so I said, okay, I think I want to do that. And what happened was he started calling me to do things, like just the impression of my heart, hey, Robin, I think you need to reach out to this person, or I need you to do this. And, and there are a lot of stories in the book. Um, 
a small example is I was on this board and we were doing some fundraising and I hated, it. I just wrote a check for the amount, the minimum amount that I was supposed to, to raise. Mm -hmm. And then God said, no, I want you to go out and I want you to raise $20,000. Well, I had written a check for 500 bucks the five years prior to that. <laughs> so there, there's no way I was going to be able to do it. He said, again, just impression of my heart. So this isn't an audible, you know, voice of God. And he said, I want you to make a list of 100 people and I want you to ask them for money. I was like, I'm not going to do that. So I'm a disciple, but mm -hmm. at every turn, I'm reluctant. He's calling mm -hmm. me to do things. And I'm like, no. Yeah, and how I know by that, right? <laughs> yes. How ridiculous is that to say, hey, I'm on the field. So in football, you're like, yes, I'm going to be a wide receiver, but I'm not going to catch any balls. Like, what if I got crunched by the safety? So I'll just be on the field. I'll play football, but I won't actually play the game. Yeah. What if the and, quarterback actually throws the ball to me, right? <laughs> and so the the title is very fitting because I spoke that over myself for about 10 years. I'm like, oh, I'm the happy, reluctant disciple. Well, finally, somebody said, don't speak reluctance over yourself. Like you're limiting. Words matter. And so I was saying, well, I'm a disciple, but I'm reluctant. That's an oxymoron. Those two things don't go together. And yet I think it's a common experience for people that are truly interested in getting on the field for God, but it's like, am I really going to do what he's calling me to do? So it's meant to be autobiographical for my experience, mm -hmm. but also connecting with other people who are like, yeah, I feel reluctant sometimes. Wow. Um, I love that. So I'm hearing a couple of parts and I'm just kind of like a two part question for you. One, the reluctance on your part, how you deal with that. Cause I imagine, listen, People who are going to be reading this book, in some shape or form, there is some reluctance, right? In their own walk, whether they're a Christian or they're just growing the business or whatever it might be, you know, they feel like I need to do this, but they're kind of going back and forth. So part one, how you deal with that. And then part two, as you are going from what you did before to what you were called to do after, I'm hearing it's probably two complete opposite things a little bit, or, you know, and I don't know if you had anybody in your life saying, well, uh, Robin's going crazy. Uh, wh what are you doing? <laughs> what, what? How do you deal with that? Right? The, all the naysayers, all the people who are saying, you're like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. So your first part um, is just how, how do I transcend the reluctance is kind of the yeah. way that I heard mm -hmm. the question. Um, I, I hesitate to share it because... Um, you know, it sounds very sort of churchy and, and I'm not meaning to. The whole point is that I got to be in relationship with God. I have to abide in him. What that means is if I love my wife and I don't talk to her, but every two or three, you know, times a year, then I'm not really in relationship, even though I love her very much. Mm -hmm. And so how can I support her if I'm not in relationship, spending time with her, talking to her, asking her questions? And so there's just this whole new world where I'm actually spending time with God that doesn't look like getting up at 5 a.m. and having a quiet time. Like I'm having a conversation with him in the car and, you know, I, just every aspect. And so when I tune my ear to what he's calling me to do, my instinct now is, yes, Lord, here I am. Now, I may have butterflies in my stomach when he says, I need you to text a text of encouragement to this guy, and I want you to say these things. I'm like, I haven't talked to that guy for six months. Like, you're bringing him to mind. You're giving me a word that you want me to share with him. No way, no how. He's going to think I'm crazy. Every single time I do it, they go, how did you know this text was perfectly timed? I'm going mm -hmm. through some stuff. I really appreciate you thinking about me, taking the time to text me, and really just, you know, supporting me in that way. And my mind is blown because I'm like, that did not come from me. Mm -hmm. That was something that I was asked to do, and I had a momentary sort of hesitation, but I stepped across the threshold to do it. And so... When you think about prayer, prayer is just a conversation with God where you're getting to know him and discern his voice, not, hey, Lord, will you please make sure this deal goes well, which I also pray for. Before mm -hmm. I send a proposal, I put my hand on that screen and I'm like, God, if this is your will, I would love to have this business. And if it's not your will, show me the way. 
So that's how I overcome the reluctance, but that is not the way that I live the majority of my life. So I'm when I say I hesitate to share it with you, I don't want to come across as if I've got it figured out. I stumble all the time, but that's the best way I know how to kind of step forward and just say, yes, Lord, here I am. All right. Which, to the second part of your question, makes me look really crazy to a lot of people. So think about your audience who's like, what is this guy talking about? What do you mean he's talking to God in this car? What do you mean he's hearing something from God and he's texting it to people? Like, I don't understand. And you can either dismiss me because it's crazy, or you can have your interest peaked and go, huh, I know a couple other people that are in that way and I kind of respect them. And so maybe there's something in this that I could explore. Because if you're not curious, if you're not interested in learning, then just stop listening to the podcast, actually. Like, just keep doing what you're doing. But if you're striving for really understanding greater fulfillment, keep listening. So Robin, like to bring us down to ground level to and speak practically about how people can start to integrate this. From hearing you and from reading the book, uh, and I have some thoughts, but I want to run them by you to see if if these are accurate or, or if you have any different suggestions. You know, the first thing I'm hearing is really kind of like, and in, in, in the book, you know, he kind of reflects a little bit on his journey. And, you know, originally having thought things were bad or they were, they were, they were just what they were and God wasn't involved. He kind of sees a little bit of God's hand on these things. Um, would you say that's a good way to kind of start recognizing God's involvement in your business? And, and is that a place where people start like and looking at their past or is it just a matter of like trying to open your awareness to like, you know, in life, you know, we call it like the nudge, like, you know, you, you feel a nudge, you feel like a, a calling to send a text or something like that. Um, how do people really like if this isn't natural to them, you know, they're not going to church, they're not reading the Bible, they're not taking quiet time. Like, what are some ways, practically speaking, that aren't too jarring, maybe, and that 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 are that yeah. represent a step in the right direction towards this integration? Yeah, um, I think it always has to be practical. So I really appreciate that you're sort of driving. Let, let's put it on the bottom shelf. Like, how how is everybody able to grab onto something that? that might open the door to, to this understanding and not be so high-minded about it. All of the business tools that I have found are written to look forward. What's your vision for the future? What are you gonna do in the next week, next 90 days, next year, next three years? Um, very few, if any, are written for reflection and look back. And so in our, we've got a group of CEOs that meet and we call it peer group. And what we're doing this year is your leadership map. And it is a reflection back to the very first time in your life where you had some sort of influence. And so take the word leadership and just put the word influence in there. You did something and got a particular result. You were able through self-determination, self-reliance, some idea you were able to actually affect a result, which typically impacts other people, therefore influence. And then every instance from that point forward to today, where did you otherwise have that impact or that influence? So that's the reflection exercise that on some level, Peter, the main character in the book, is doing because he believed that God dismissed him. God had kind of washed his hands of him. Well, what he realizes is he had dismissed God. God had been there the entire time. Mm -hmm. So back to the practical analogy, when you're able to see your leadership influence successes in successive chronological order from some, some people are showing up at like 15, 14, 15 years old and pulling it forward, that's a body of work that you then get to see what was my hand in creating that and what was luck. Because if we don't have a faith and there are things that we can't explain, we ascribe it to luck. You got to be good to be lucky or you got to be in the right place so that luck can smile on you. It's like, okay, if that's your worldview, then you did these things and got this result. And there's some results that you can't account for that you're going to ascribe to luck. For the rest of us who have a faith, we're like, ah, the hand of God was moving in my journey from that point to this point because he allowed me to have this influence even beyond my own ability to make that happen. 
Got it. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so seeing, tying those, I guess what I'm, what I'm visually imagining as you're talking is like a, a, uh, connect the dots kind of thing and mm. you connect the dots and you see the picture and you're like, wow, I, I saw previous to this, I only saw the dots. I didn't see the pattern. I didn't see the picture. Um, and that this, this it's a great exercise that I think, uh, uh, would really be instructive and helpful for people. Well, I think you didn't see the quote unquote, the luck thing, right? Um, when you go and start to go back to that past and you see the luck part, you start seeing, well, how you start questioning a little bit, I think, right? You start asking the questions like, how did that happen? How did that work out? Right. And then I think you start to expand your thinking. And if you are looking to, you know, uh, when it comes to faith, uh, I think that starts to unravel a little bit more so you can get closer to that. When the flip side of luck is mojo. So I'll have a lot of uh, CEOs that I work with and they'll say, Robin, I'm just stuck. I've lost my mojo. And I'm like, well, we better find it. Yeah. And they go <laughs> and they go, what do you mean? And I was like, well, where did you last see it? And And we go into this sort of silly conversation and I'm like, if you're going to ascribe your success to some third, you know, uh, inanimate object called Mojo, then we better go find it so that you can continue to be successful. And it immediately highlights the fallacy of that argument, which is this isn't Mojo. This is about you knowing what your strengths are, what your skills are, and being able to see opportunities and then step forward. We who have a faith also recognize that God is playing a part. He has plans for us, plans to prosper us, not to harm us. And so we're working in concert with what he's calling us to do. The rest of the world just says, oh, it's me plus luck. And then that's where I get until mm -hmm. they realize that they're not fully fulfilled. They're like, well, where's my luck? Lady luck hasn't smiled on me in a long time. And I'm like, well, maybe you just wait a little bit longer and you can see their energy and fulfillment and lack of purpose. And it just, it causes burnout, causes midlife crises. It causes uh, maladaptive behaviors, which is the science term for bad habits. And we do things that we're saying, you know, we never thought we would do these things because we're searching for that fulfillment and we'll fill that hole with a lot of things of the world that aren't necessarily, you know, great. Mm, got it, man. Well, hey, I want to I wanna thank you for writing the book. Where do people learn more about you, what you're up to, and also grab their copy? Yeah, so the book title is The Reluctant Disciple. So we grabbed that URL, thereluctantdisciple.com. So you can learn everything about the book at that site. Also, just for me personally and the work that I do with leaders, robinpugh.com, so R-O-B-I-N-P-O-U.com, and that's the information related to the leadership development firm that I run with the, the team here, so robinpugh.com, and then on social, yeah. Well, man, I'm grateful for you, for your contributions, and I'm excited to see how things move forward for you for here. Thank you for being on the yeah. show. Absolutely. Thanks, guys, for having me. I appreciate it. Man, that was a cool conversation. I really enjoyed uh, hearing his perspective on that. And dude, as he was talking, like, so I'm aware of, uh, you know, as he's talking, I'm, I'm made aware of like all these cool um, correla correlations between what he went through in the book, because the, the gentleman, the story, Peter, like a lot of the same situations were, uh, were reflected. And it reminds me of the Life in Air book a little bit, how, you know, mm -hmm. all the stories in the Life in Air book are true stories. They're just put together into one you know, a cohesive plot so you can actually follow it instead of, you know, all the different plots that kind of occurred uh, in real life. But like, dude, um, I really, I, what I enjoy about this is like, I think, I think, you know, God's all around us. And sometimes we just think that we're, we like, we walk into like a, like a, uh, a different room that God's not in when it comes to business. And like, we kind of just don't see his presence and we don't, you know, appreciate it or even like maybe seek his input on things too. And we kind of just, you know, the question I asked about was like, you know, relying on yourself. And mm -hmm. I think this is a challenge like for any capable person to like, let, you know, you, you let the cart get out in front of the horse and um, it's it's not the way to go. Right. I might, if you're an entrepreneur, I think that's, it happens for a lot of people. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have to do it myself, you know, and that's what, think about it in life on that when we have people coming into our coaching program, a lot of the first initial things 
is to allow that entrepreneur to let go of some of those things so he doesn't do it himself, right? But when you were talking about the spiritual conversation and you discover that you're not here by yourself, there is no Lord in your life and he's leading you and there is a plan kind of a thing, it becomes, I think, a simpler way of actually dealing with those things and um, and life because, you know, we're called to do something. You know, he talked about talents. You know, what are your talents that you have? I mean, if you're listening to this particular episode, I don't know if you ever thought about what my talents really are. It may not be, you know, business-like. It might be something else. You know, one of my students, their talent is cooking. I mean, this woman can cook food like nobody's business. Um, and that is something that she can utilize to not only for their family, but community or whatever it might be, right? So um, it's knowing those point, talents, though, I think, is a big thing, huh? Well, that's not just knowing them, but it's like, what is... What's the purpose of the talent? Why have I been given this talent? Why have I been given the the discipline, the will, the whatever you want to look at it to develop this talent, right? And what's the real purpose behind it? Because it's because you know any talent that we've been given as a gift has to tie back to the kingdom. Like there's got to be some sort of relationship as to why this was given aside from just benefiting ourselves. And yeah. so like I, I I love that perspective, man. Of like who else can I benefit with this, and who else can I help with this with this blessing? Yeah, the other thing that kind of jumped out at me in this particular episode is he talked about the map towards the end, right? And he had people look back on his yeah. life. And what's the first initial events that had an impact on you? I mean, it had an impact, right? Um, I don't know if this matters. Like, you know, you know my story. Like, I went back to when I was eight years old. That had a big impact. If I look my entire life, that had a huge impact for the whole trajectory of my life. Good, bad, whatever, right? But if you start looking from that perspective for yourself, the listener, and you go back and look at what those events were, the impact of them, and then what was, you know, he talked about the, you know, luck in parentheses, how that played into the role, you can probably see, like, we're not here by ourselves, you know, there is something more to that, you know, yeah. God is um, leading the way. And, uh, and then the whole other thing about being reluctant, I think this is, I think, I mean, I wrestle with it. I mean, he said he wrestles with it. I think we all wrestle with it, you know what I mean? Because there is sometimes the things that he asks us to do, you know, I'm like, are you crazy? Really? Uh, what? Right? So yeah. um, it's a really, I think it gets us present intentional to what we're here for. I think that's but, the book is doing. Yeah, man, I think it's, you know, I think it's, it's interesting because if you don't, if you don't, I think of it almost like as an evolution. Like, so at the early stages of your faith, you don't see God present at all. And so it's a journey of getting to know him and getting closer and taking taking that step and then, you know, extending that arm, that hand to, to develop a relationship. And then as you develop a relationship, some of the things that you hear are not what you expect to hear because God's ways are not man's ways. And so, yeah. so that, takes, that takes courage and that takes... Um, you know, uh, faith, like that, that's why it's called faith. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, being around other people and, and having wise counsel and, and those kinds of things, he quoted Proverbs a couple of times, uh, mm -hmm. I think is, is valuable. And at the end of the, at the end of the day, it's an, it's an amazing journey. Like the reward isn't, and by the way, we talked about, you know, what's good and what's bad. I think, you know, the reward is the relationship with God. It's not whether you, you know, quote unquote, succeed or don't succeed because in a long enough time horizon, like that, what you think is a failure now could be a victory and vice versa. And so it's just this amazing walk. It's another dimension of fulfillment um, that I think, you know, no, no worldly amount of success can take the place of a spiritual need. And so, yeah, it's just a great reminder. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Hope you got something out of it. Hope you find a way to integrate your own faith and your spirituality with your business because it's a whole new level once you do. Uh, if you like the episode, please leave us a review or rating and share it with somebody who needs to hear this. We will see you next week, everyone. Take care. <laughs>